Uh, so you guys got a glimpse of uh, what CXL can do. Uh, Vincent and Jerome covered it very well. Uh, specifically, they mentioned the fact that um, you can do memory pooling. So the, the, the whole idea with CXL is first do no harm, but that's not fun. We want to do add capabilities and take advantage of the features that CXL provides also. Uh, Jerome touched on the point of being able to do memory pooling. And today, uh, with a wonderful conversation that we have here, we're going to go through the motivations uh, of memory pooling and uh, a very good practical example of it that's running uh, on the show floor here that Ahmad is going to cover. A quick introduction as well. Hi everyone, my name is Ahmad Dinesh, Senior Director of Product Management at Astera Labs. I'm Dan Ernst. I'm a Principal Architect at uh, Microsoft Azure where we're, I uh, run the Memory Architecture Pathfinding Team. Good, so, uh, and I am Siamak Tavalai. Um, uh, privileged to be uh, uh, CXL president. I'm very active with OCP as well. I'm part of the incubation committee <coughs> serving for the server project. I'm part of Google architectural team. Great, I think I will take that. <clears throat> All right, great. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming out so early. Um, so this talk is about memory pooling, but in, uh, in our view, every good solution really needs to start from a problem right? that we need solved. And so what I'm going to talk about first is what is the, the state of cloud memory um, and really give you a, a, an insight into some of the problems we're facing. And then we'll talk about how CXL and memory pooling is, is showing us a path where we might be able to solve some of these. I think you know, the biggest way to state the problem is that memory is the largest source of cost in a data center, um, or is or is becoming. Uh, and this, um, in cases today even, we're seeing where DRAM can be half of a system cost. Um, in the future, we think the averages of this is gonna go up and continue to go up based on some differences between the scaling between processors and memory, right? Um, which means that the real focus area, for those of you who are familiar with Amdahl's law of where should we be optimizing, for cost points directly at the largest component, right? We need to be working on our memory system and figuring out how we can, um, how we can bring this down without hurting our mainstay, which is the performance that we expect from memory. It's a really important part of performance. Um, on top of the, the, the cost factor of memory, it turns out that within the cloud, a lot of times memory is not very well utilized. Um, this was touched on a little bit by Jerome in the last, in the last talk, but in, in within Microsoft Azure, we've done studies to observe and seen that up to 25% of the memory in our cloud uh, is what we call stranded, which is it's memory that is on a node uh, that has filled up its CPU cores, but has no, uh, it, has, <laughs> it has memory that's still unsold, right? So it has leftover memory. Uh, and no way to, to, to use that memory to sell that memory. Um, that's uh, when you start thinking about the cost factor of memory, that's pretty stark, right? That's, that's a lot of money that's sitting in our data center and not really helping anybody get any work done, right? Now, interestingly, on top of that, this is just a measure of what we would call sold memory, right? Um, it turns out that our customers also over-provision memory. I think this is a fairly natural thought process, right? When you're going to run a workload, you buy a, a VM type that's naturally going to be larger than, strictly larger than, whatever you're running, right? Uh, but it turns out that when I say strictly larger than, it's significant, right? Um, the med median VM is, you know, touching only, you know, 55 or so percent of memory. Now, that doesn't change the stranding argument. We're still selling that memory. But it does give us some options to think about in terms of managing the performance aspect. Um, so with this as the problem statement, um, you know, there's a fancy graph, but it might be better to sort of look at this a little more visually to understand what's happening here. Right? So if you can think of a collection of servers um, with workloads landing on them, right? we have a certain amount of memory capacity that we deploy per server, but the median use right, is below that number, as you can see sort of on the left there, right? So this means that we've, we're leaving a lot of memory 
unutilized within those servers, right? Now, you'd say, well, why don't we just deploy less memory, right? If we deploy less memory, that, that's, we're saving that memory. However, we've now made those cases where we actually need all that memory impossible, right? Uh, and so those are entire categories of services that we can no longer then deploy, right? So the goal of memory pooling is to try and mitigate and cut the difference between these two models, right? And that is, let's deploy that less amount of memory, but let's try to soak up the variance, right? The, 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 the small number of large uh, jobs um, in a pool nearby. This allows us to deploy overall significantly less memory because we're only deploying enough in the pool, again, to capture that variance and not deploying the maximum amount across all the servers. Right? This is a benefit for utilization. This is a benefit for um, efficiency in, within the, the cloud, and it's a benefit for things like sustainability. So how can memory pooling help? It's a fairly simple idea. Share stranded memory with nearby servers that have free cores uh, to balance out the memory load. We've done analysis of how much this would help. We look through the mapping of VMs onto the Azure services, onto our Azure hardware, and we looked at different percentages of VM memory uh, uh, assigned to the pool, right? Small pieces, larger amounts, or even up to half, right? And what we, what we saw looking at the schedule, and again, this is a completely uninformed scheduler, is that if we just group servers in small groups of, of what we call a, a pool, within a pool radix, right, the number of CPU sockets within the pool, we saw benefits in terms of reduced DRAM that would be up to, um, you know, uh, in the neighborhood of more than 10%, right? And more interestingly, some of those benefits came with as small a pool size as four or eight sockets, right? Not very large. Um, and so small pools, even small pool sizes could be useful. And again, I'll add that this is uh, based on an allocator that is not thinking about this problem at all, right? This is an existing schedule. It's not even trying to be intelligent about this mapping. Okay. So the challenge, as I mentioned before, really is how do we manage the performance of the workloads in this sort of hybrid memory environment, this tiered memory environment. Um, having a smaller pool can actually help with this to a certain extent um, because it keeps the overheads low, the latency overheads, the cost overheads, all of those things we need to keep low in order for us to, to achieve the gains we need without impacting our services. Um, there is a, a paper we've put out that explores some of the solutions around that space if you're interested in knowing more. Um, some of you may have heard some of that yesterday uh, Samir Rajadnia gave a talk uh, as part of a, 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 the new, so, um, what's the new name, CMAC? It's not Software Defined Memory. Composable, Composable Memory Subgroup. So, um, so uh, feel free to check that out if you'd like to know more. So to talk a little bit about how we could actually build <clears throat> systems like this and pools like this, I'm going to hand it over to Ahmad. Thank you, Dan. So there's three key pieces that Dan talked about here. Is Small pools can help. We want to be able to create a solution where we can dynamically move that pool to, access, to, to provide access to different CPUs. And a key portion of that is the performance. Now, the scheduler, as he is talking about here, is not really comprehending what is a memory pool today. The data you see here in terms of the number of the pool radix is based on an assumption that that pool of memory has the same performance that you can expect from local or remote memory that's being used today. So as we move forward into the architecture of how do we build these actual solutions with CXL, we have a couple options. And uh, Vincent and Jerome gave a couple of really good explanation of what SLDs are, how we do, can do this with MLDs. What does this physical infrastructure ultimately look like? If we do what I would call a direct attached, multi-headed SLD, you can have a number of hosts, a number of CPUs that are all interconnected directly to these, what I'm showing as D1 through D count here, are all CXL memory controllers, each of which are multi-headed SLDs. Each, of, each port here in the case provides a single CXL port to each host. Each port is represented essentially as a single logical device. As far as the host is concerned, it sees a CXL memory expander. When we move towards 
a switch architecture, this is where the single-headed multi-logical devices or even the multi-headed multi-logical devices that Vincent and Jerome were talking about can be built. But we have to take a look at and compare the actual performance characteristics. How do you actually build these solutions when you want to take it at scale to really comprehend the benefits that you can get out of these solutions? So when we look at MHSLDs, the clear benefit in first is that it's going to be lower latency. You can avoid a switch hop. Now the challenge, though, as we move forward is how do you scale this out? Dan talked about, well, small amount of pool or smaller pool rate x can help, but it will be physically challenging to build memory controllers that have enough ports for, let's say, 64 different CPUs. There's going to be physical constraints in terms of package size, enclosure dimensions to be actually be able to build that solution. And then ultimately, what a switch would have provided in terms of the crossbars and interconnect, now this has to be a cabled solution. And so we have to think about how do we scale this out, what type of read timers, perhaps optical level solutions are needed in the future to be able to build these solutions at scale. But switches do have their advantage as well. When we take a look at the blast radius, if any one of these devices goes down, we have a memory pool that's actually being assigned to multiple hosts. A single device going down can now impact multiple hosts. Of course, we do have protection in that in terms of hot plug surprise plug capabilities, the ability for, in the future for hosts to manage memory disappearing. And then fundamentally, from the biggest challenge of a CXL switch solution is the higher cost and the higher power of it. So when we take a look at each of these architectures, which one's going to be a more of a near-term solution, which one's going to be a more long-term solution, and taking a look at memory tiering and how that fits into the space so that the host can actually comprehend, here's my tier one memory, here's my tier two and tier three, to be able to dynamically allocate the pool depending on the workload needs of that specific application. So we have to look at the trade-offs in the design. Now fundamentally, the challenge is that we want to minimize the latency so that we can provide a consistent performance across a broad range of servers. When someone's going to deploy a server, you typically build a handful of SKUs. You're not going to build a dedicated SKU for each application workload. And so we want to be able to build a solution that can service as many of those workloads as possible so that we can have less CPU server SKUs and then have more workloads being serviced by them. Ultimately, very clear insight is the lower the latency, the broader the range of workloads that can be serviced with the pool. And ultimately, what that means is the higher the TCO savings that you can get. So let's take a look at some actual data here to see where does it rank between looking at multi-logical devices sitting behind a switch and multi-headed devices without a switch. Now, I'm going to throw a caveat out here that this latency is estimated. Right? This is not based on any specific vendor data. But on the far right-hand chart here, what we can see is the blue dots there are showing a multi-headed device, multi-headed single logical device. It's going to be roughly in the range of about what a NUMA node today is, or, or a remote uh, hop would be today. And software today can handle that. It understands what local memory is and remote memory, and a lot of software applications can handle that level of latency. When we go to a single switch hop, we start looking at significantly higher latency, which will impact the amount of workloads that can actually be serviced with that server. And then, of course, if we get to CXL 3.0, when we can start doing multiple switches in a path, taking a look at potentially fabric-level solutions, where we have multiple switches in the path connected to these, that's going to increase the latency even further. This is where memory tiering will become important. It might be able to service less specific workloads. And so what we want to do is be able to, today, start launching solutions that can take advantage of what's capable with CXL 1.1 today with multi-headed single logical devices. A key thing to note here is while CXL 3.0 specifically introduced the terminology for multi-headed single logical devices, it is possible to build those with CXL 1.1 CPUs today. We can actually be able to create these because ultimately from the CPU's perspective, it looks like a CXL memory expander. The device can manage that and present separate CXL ports to each CPU and be able to provide that abstraction and that hardware abstraction layer and address translation within the memory controller and present different allocations of address ranges to each CPU. And finally, memory pooling with multi-headed devices is here today. So we actually have our Leo memory connectivity platform providing multi-headed solution working with Intel's fourth generation Intel Xeon processors. This is a CXL 1.1 capable CPU. 
And it's a pretty simple concept. What you're seeing on this diagram here is how that memory is being allocated and split up. Now, in our case, we're doing it with Intel CPUs, but this can fundamentally be done with GPUs, with accelerators, and bifurcating those CXL ports, presenting those multi-headed devices to each CPU, and then being able to dynamically allocate those with exactly the way that uh, Vincent and Jerome were speaking about. And I'll pass it back to RCMAC. Do you want to come back on and talk about management and next steps as we move forward with the industry? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so great motivation and solutions. There's actually the solutions are on the show floor. Go take a look at it. These things are not PowerPoints anymore. Uh, one, one, one point to uh, mention, uh, with the memory pooling, of course, we will um, take care of memory stranding. But our goal here is not to uh, buy less memory. We want to buy a lot of memory, but use them efficiently. Basically, you, you remember the Parkinson's law. Uh, work will occupy all the time you give it to it. The corollary for that for computer architecture is uh, computing will occupy and use all of the memory you give it to it. So we would like to use more and more and more memory, assign larger blocks of memory to a, a CPU core, and CPU cores and applications will use them all. But we want to use them efficiently, so we are sustainable, we're green, we are good. So uh, today we did cover uh, simpler devices. And as I said earlier, crawl, walk, run works very well. And uh, first do no harm is a very important attribute for software guys. Uh, software guys, as, 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 as Ahmed just said, you can use techniques that you have for PCIe techniques that you use for just addressing memory as a single logical device, and your software will just work. Now, if we want to do more, uh, there are a number of uh, talks today that expand this capability. Yeah, we go to larger fabric, we have more latency, but there are some use cases that don't mind that. And there's, there's software being developed to do the memory tiering, as, as uh, Ahmad and Dan mentioned. Uh, <coughs> to, uh, although there is more latency, but use it efficiently, so the perception of latency to individual applications is, is smaller. So uh, life is good. Uh, we have a lot of work in front of us. We need your help. Come up with use cases and contribute your solutions to CXL Consortium. We write them all in spec, and software interfaces will be eventually uh, streamlined, so we can all use each other's work. Final call to action as well, of, of, right? As we've shown, CXL memory pooling is, is really already here or coming soon in various levels of, of coming soon and already here, right? Um, OCP is going to play a role in the infrastructure to support future pooling systems. So um, we're going to need, obviously, hardware systems. The idea of doing connectivity that is not within a server uh, adds some really interesting challenges that we're going to have to address. Um, and there are a lot of infrastructure software and management uh, aspects we're going to have to address in the next few years as we really move along this ramp of ena enabling composable memory. Um, so please join the work group um, and, and uh, come work with us to, to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.